Uh, we had old theater seats that you had to sit down carefully because the handles would snag your pants. I ripped many a pair of pants. Ladies would rip their dresses standing up too quickly and little narrow seats built in the 1900s. It was really a, an amazing little church. The carpet was as yellow as my brother's shirt back there. Yes, indeed. Someone had donated it, found it out later. They stole it in Texas and gave it to the church. <laughs> great history, great, great history there. We, we, had, we were there about a year, and um, God gave us a miracle. Uh, there was another church. They had six and a half acres. Uh, their sanctuary is two and a half times our size. Long story short, in two months, for $200 filing fees, a broker, um, a real estate lady, sold our property and bought that property. Um, we sold our little quarter acre for $120,000 and bought the whole mess over there, the six and a half acres, for 80000 It was a miracle. My district called me and said, are you sure you haven't put enough zeros down? You, you're, this is really strange. I said, hey, it's a miracle. Call it a miracle. We were happy as clams getting ready to buy burial plots in Camp Verde. Now in Camp Verde, at that time, you could dig your own grave. And uh, that's how primitive the... Uh, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, got a call on a Wednesday night. Pastor Cal, the founder of this church, said, uh, Lan, he said, uh, guess what? We're moving to Tennessee and uh, I'm taking a church back there. I said, well, Cal, what does that have to do with me at... 11.30 on a Wednesday night. He said, well, I just came out of a board meeting and they asked me who I thought they should contact to call as the next pastor. And back in November, God laid your names on our hearts. And I go, what? He goes, yeah. He said, would you consider? I said, Cal, I'm happy. I'm done. I'm, I'm here. I'm, I'm not moving. God's not speaking to my heart about moving anywhere. And he said, what would you consider? I said, sure. Got off the phone, spoke to my wife, and, and she said, what happened? I explained, and um, she said, are you going to pray? And I said, yeah. God, should we go to Lake Havasu City? Yep, that's what I thought. No, we're not going to go. <laughs> you ever prayed like that? <laughs> you didn't wait for the answer. Anyway, we were due to go to a vacation, and uh, that Sunday night as we drove to Sedona, we had a week. Uh, a week's vacation there and we had to use it or lose it so we went and on the way out of town happy as clams holding hands singing in the car pulling out of Camp Verde my wife always interrupts the flow of my thoughts with questions she said honey are you going to go look at Lake Havasu City I said nope and when I say nope with a on the end that pretty final, but she wouldn't stop there. She said, why? And through gritted teeth, I said, because I don't want God to put a hook in my jaw. Oh, so she was quiet then, and we had a wonderful Monday, and some friends, Lafayette and Fran Coleman, came on Tuesday. And as we told him this funny story, Lafayette says to me, while holding his can of Coca-Cola and his chips and we're all having a good time. He says, wow, strange story. He says, what are you going to do about it? And I said, nothing. And he goes, what? Why? And immediately, Leith and I both burst into tears. And I said, because I don't want God to mess with me. <laughs> he put his Coke down and his chips down. And he looked me straight in the eye. He said, Pastor, I've never known that part of you. Why? I said, I'm afraid. I don't want him to mess with me. And I was bawling like a baby. And Lafayette said, well, pastor, what would it hurt for you just to go and see? I said, all right, I will. <laughs> so Wednesday, we left Sedona, came over here, had a wonderful lunch, and, and uh, Cal showed us around and service that night, great service. And then Wayne and Lynn was sitting in front of us, and Lynn turned around after service and said, so you're our new pastor. I go, I'm visiting. Leave me alone. I'm just visiting. 
you knew something, sis. I didn't. And then we found out later that Jan, back in, in, in women's retreat, had said, God, she saw Aletha cutting up with all of our ladies at, from Camp Verde. And I think that was the year you had squirt guns and everything else, and you were in trouble with some of the camp leaders because you were taking someone else's fan. They had several, and you needed one. That wasn't the year. My wife is well-known in camp. Anyway. <laughs> And Jan prayed, God, give us a pastor's wife like that. who will just love us where we are, for who we are. So Jan, your prayer started. Lynn, your prophetic word. And all of a sudden, Pastor Cal comes out and he says, board wants to meet you. I said, Cal, I said, I'm just here looking. I'm not interested in coming. He said, come on. We walk in the door. The board together says, you're the man. You're it. Come preach for us on Sunday. They had to get special permission because you don't have a pastor tell his board on Wednesday, resign on a Sunday, and candidate the new pastor the following Sunday. It's, that's just not the way it's done. But that's the way God did it. So we had to sneak all the way to Camp Verde to get some church clothes, my three-piece suit, don't forget, <laughs> and uh, came and preached a sermon similar to this based on these scriptures I'm going to share with you in half a moment. But I want, you, I want to say to you, God has a means and a method to everything he does. So keep your hearts open. Have teachable spirits because God has something to share with you today. Every day, actually. So that January, I'd been praying, as I said before, and God laid on my heart a portion of scripture Hebrews 11, 11. And as I saw that scripture, God spoke to my heart and immediately had a revelation from God. He said, you judged me wrong. Have you ever tried to explain something to God? When he's made a statement and you're sure you're not, you're not there where he said you were? I said, ha. I said, look, your word tells me I can't even judge another person, let alone who am I to judge you? And God spoke to my heart and said, you know what? You've judged me late. You've judged me unconcerned. You've judged me only um, to be about my things rather than your things. And, I'll, and, and, and you judge me like uh, I'll work you in somewhere when the time is right. And I said, oh God, forgive me. I'm sorry. And the Lord spoke to my heart and said this. You only have one legal righteous way to judge me. I'm going to t this, this is something that has absolutely changed and altered my life. He said, you have the right to stand on your toes if you want, look me dead in the eye, point your finger in my nose and say, God, I judge you faithful. I judge you faithful. You'll never do anything against me. You'll never do anything wrong. You'll never do anything that will put me in a bad position. You will be able always to judge me faithful. And I want us to look at the scriptures today, please, because, you know, <clears throat> that first week of February, I'd called the church in Camp Verde to fast and pray. And uh, as we came in, we prayed about the normal things. Man, judging God faithful had been my theme, and we were hacking and whacking at it. You know what I mean? And here we were in that week of uh, fasting and prayer, first week of February. Little did I know, the last week of February, when we were on vacation, God would interrupt our lives forever. And when we, we went on that vacation, when we were here in the church, we preached that morning, Judge God Faithful. Some of you were here, perhaps you remember that, that message. But I went home, called Letha's folks, and my father-in-law said, you're what doing, you're, you're where doing what? And I said, I, I, we're candidating for a church. Well, I thought you guys were, set, you know, whole, the whole settled, the whole thing. I called my, my folks. My dad was ill. I thought he was dying. My phone card ran out. I couldn't renew the phone card. There was no way to contact my folks. He, I thought he was there dying. He was weeping and crying and would not call 911. And, and I had to come to church that night not knowing whether my, my father had died, whether he had had a stroke, 
whether he was laying on the floor, uh, incapacitated, I had no idea. But I came that Sunday night and with full of, full of confidence in a God who loved me, I ministered again from that portion of Scripture, judge God faithful. And that night there was a vote of 100%. I, could, I couldn't believe it. Superintendent stood up here in the front shaking his head. He said, Brother Blair, it just doesn't happen that way. I said, yeah, I know. I, now I have to return home and say, guess what happened to me on vacation? So, anyway, for a while the church would not allow me to go on vacation. But it's okay. <laughs> Hebrews 11, chapter 1. Now faith is the substance, the very essence, the building blocks. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. I cannot see faith until it manifests in the natural. Now I'm going to say this on this side of the pulpit this morning. I cannot see faith until it manifests. Look, I've never been to heaven. I've never seen God face to face. But I'll tell you what, I know his voice. I know his influence. I know the touch of his hand upon my life. I know truth that emanates from the word of God. And I want you to know he is always faithful in all of these things. And precious friend, faith, the substance or building block of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. The very existence of faith in my heart and the strong compulsion upon me. To believe the word of God is evidence of God's grace in my life. Not everything goes right all the time. You understand what I'm saying? Christianity, a walk with Christ, is not a walk in the park. It's not the, the, the what do they call it? It's not always peachy keen or whatever else. I don't know what else, how to say it. But the fact of the matter is God is faithful. And in the good times, and in the bad times, and in the in-between times, why don't we just stand still and hear the still, small voice of God? This is the way. Walk in it. And there are times, he says, stand still and see the glory of your Lord. There are other times, he said, advance on. I'll give you the victory. As you move forward, you've got to put feet to it. Sometimes you stand there. Sometimes you move forward. Sometimes you wait expectantly because you know he's always faithful. For by it, by faith, the elders obtained a good testimony. Their lives were set on a course of grace because of God's word in their hearts. By faith we understand, verse 3, that the worlds were framed by the word of God. God spoke and the world came into being. In the original <clears throat> Hebrew, in, in, in Genesis where it says God said light be. The form that is used there is a command form. And the translation, the true translation of that instead of let light be, it's this way. Before light existed, God said light be. And light became. He didn't have to explain what light was. He didn't have to put the plan down somewhere. He spoke into existence that which had not existed. And it became. And if the word of God is that powerful. Would you hear my heart this morning? If the word of God is that powerful. That what it does not exist. All of a sudden comes into existence. And then John writes that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Then precious friend, when I tell you that the eternal word, the eternal son, Jesus Christ is the word of God. And he speaks to our hearts. Should we or should we not respond? If he's the word and the solidity of heaven is based upon the word. Then should we not take that as powerfully important in our lives? Shouldn't we speak the word of God into our situations instead of saying, oh my God, what are we going to do? Why don't we say, oh my God, what would you like me to do? 
Instead of saying, oh my God, what do we do? Say, God, what do you want us to do? Friend, I call you to task this morning. You have a greater relationship with God because of what he's done for you and me than any other reason to stand and stand firmly in your faith. Would you please stop disqualifying you and trust in what Jesus has done and who he is? And if you'll do that, you'll find, if, if you put your confidence in yourself, you're going to find yourself goofing up. You really are. And you're, I know because I speak from experience. If you trust your own understanding, it's going to lead you astray. Because who, who in this room never has misunderstood something? I don't see any hands raised. We have the ability to misunderstand easily. Have you ever believed something and lived with it for a long time until someone showed you that that was not the truth? I, I used to think as a kid growing up in church, I used to think the only way you could contact God, if you screwed your faith, face together just like, Whoa. and the only way you could contact him is if you thought of something that made you cry. I used to think of my grandmother dying and I would go to the altar, and go, oh, my grandmother, she wasn't dead, but... I would think of her dying and tears would begin to flow and I would screw up my face. Oh, God. Thought that's the only way that you could get a hold of the Lord. How wrong I was. How wrong I was. Do you have misperceptions? How are you judging God? How are you judging God in your life? I call you to think about that this morning. Look, it says, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. By faith, Abel, Cain and Abel, by faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, uh, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through, uh, through it, being dead still speaks. Look, Abel didn't get a long chance to exist in this world. His brother killed him. The unrighteous killed the righteous one. And yet his testimony lives to this day. He worshipped God in truth and with wisdom. And friends, it's your choice. You can worship the Lord in spirit and in truth, or you can just say... Hey, yeah, yeah, God, the old man upstairs, the guy up there, whatever, whatever. Don't speak disrespectfully of the Lord. And for heaven's sakes, if you find your little mouth being a potty mouth, why don't you adjust that and ask God, God, clean my mouth. He won't wash your mouth out with soap, but he will clean your mouth. If you're willing for him to work in you. Okay. I stopped preaching. Gone to meddling. Hallelujah. Maybe someone needed that. By faith Enoch. Verse 5. Was taken away. So that he did not see death. And was not found. Because God had taken him. For before he was taken. He had this testimony. Let this be our testimony church. That he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Do you believe God is God? Then act like it. Believe like it. Move upon it. If God is God, believe what he says in his word and act accordingly. By faith, Noah, verse 7. By faith, um, uh, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. Look, the whole land was full of people doing what was wrong. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And not only was a, a Noah a man of grace, but I'll tell you what, he taught his family properly. And when God began to speak to his heart about building this huge ark, let me tell you, people thought he was a nut. And he preached, he preached, he preached about the floods coming, the rains coming, the floods coming. No one had ever seen anything like that before. 
And suddenly the ark was ready and it stood there as a mute testimony to the stupidity of a man who would build a boat that big. But really it was a testimony to the man who trusted God who said, prepare it. And when the door was open and the animals came and his family went in and the door was shut, people still stood outside until the raindrops began to fall. And then they began to cry, open the door and let us in. And, and Noah had to shout out, God shut the door, I cannot open it. And Noah and his family were saved. So friends, by faith, obey the Lord. Look, in verse number 8. Obey God when you don't know where you're going. Obey God when you don't know how it's going to work out. Obey God where you are. Obey God for why, even though you don't know the answer to it. My friends, by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. Have you ever been there sometime? You don't know where you're going, but, but you'll get there. You got GPS, as long as it doesn't lead you astray. In case you haven't found out. By faith, there he dwelt in the land of promise, as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which, was, uh, which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Abraham lived in a temporary manner because he had something permanent coming down the road. You may not understand your circumstances at this moment, but I'll tell you what, you have a permanency coming in the presence of God. There's a permanent place in heaven with your name on it. God's prepared that for you. You say, well, that's just a wonderful story. No, it's the truth. I, I think God... God has minimalized what he tells us in the word because we couldn't take the full impact of it. It has to be something that we can think of, something that we can uh, dwell on, something that we can um, uh, work with in our imagination. But it's so far above and beyond anything we can imagine. I, I think God's kind of, um, if you'll pardon the expression, dumbed it down for us to handle at this point in life. When your children are small, you don't tell them about the birds and the bees. One day, they'll receive that information and they'll learn by it. But friends, I think God speaks to us and he says, hold on. It's going to be so great. <laughs> hold on just a little longer because heaven is so real. Heaven's going to blow your socks off. Heaven's going to be something else. And, and, and I'm just excited to meet Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm excited to meet Jesus most of all, but I'm excited to talk to some of those apostles. I'm excited to see my great grandma who prayed for me when I was scalded as a five and a half month old baby in a sink full of blistering water. Accidentally, the water was released on me. I was put in the hospital, expected to die several days. My mom said she visited with, and they would take bandages off of me and my little flesh would fall off my little, my little baby body. My great-grandmother hauled her preacher down to the hospital. They anointed me with oil, prayed the prayer of faith, and God healed me. The only lasting result is I don't like real hot showers. Thank you so much. No scars, nothing on me to show that I was ever scalded. But friends, I almost died except for my great-grandma tombs. She, she wouldn't give up. She knew how to slap heaven and earth together. I tell you what, and out of that miracle, my grandmother, her oldest daughter, and, and my mom and dad and my aunt and uncle were saved, brought to the Lord because of the miracle of God's grace. I'm telling you, we have a God who's faithful. Let me hurry on a little further, please. And it says this, he waited for God. By faith, Sarah herself, verse number 11, by faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed. Now some of you ladies, God bless you. You could pop a baby every other year if you wanted. God bless you for your fortitude. I'm, I'm not getting too personal now. <laughs> and other precious ladies have tried for years. My, my brother and his wife tried for 10 years. And finally produced a son. For some women it's very difficult to conceive. And for other women who have conceived, 
and had stillborn or miscarriages or whatever, God bless your darling hearts. God will reward you. But I tell you what, for a 90-year-old woman to conceive was a total miracle. To carry the child to birth, another powerful miracle. And to be able to nurse it and raise it, oh, my mercy. I'm almost 70, and, and my two little granddaughters, they exercise my faith quite a bit. I can't run with them down the hallway like I used to run with the others. You know what I mean? But look, she received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age because, because, because she judged him faithful who had promised. She judged him faithful who had promised. Look, friend, it's time that we look at God and say, God, I judge you faithful. When my feelings go south, I judge you faithful. When my circumstances betray me, I judge you faithful. When people are not faithful to me in our friendship, I judge you faithful. God, when things are squirrely in my life, I judge you faithful. When things are good, I judge you faithful. When things are happening that I would like to go in a different direction, I judge you faithful. Why? Because the person that judges God Faithful will be able to conceive the answer. Would you grasp this with me, please? I said, if you judge God faithful, you'll be able to conceive the answer. You'll be able to bear the answer. And you'll be able, enabled by the Spirit of grace, to birth the answer. A baby just doesn't come along. One day you're pregnant, next day you're a mama. No, it doesn't work like that. Nine months, right? Woohoo! And you're looking towards the end of that, right? Oh, glory. Be thankful it's not August. That's all I can say. I'm telling you what. You want the ability that God gives? You're going to have to judge Him faithful. And I promise you, when you judge him faithful, look, 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 look. You will be able to conceive the answer. As the Spirit of God moves within you miraculously and puts two and two together and brings the formula, whatever it may be, in God's economy in his time, you'll conceive the answer. And you'll walk down the road going, I'm pregnant with the answer of God. I'm pregnant with the answer of God. And as you begin to grow in that, and you be, it'll, it'll show. Ladies, two or three months, some of you go four or five months and never show a bit. Then all of a sudden, oh, there you go. But don't you have a special feeling when someone looks at you and goes, yeah, you're expecting, <laughs> I see the bulge. Let me tell you something in some of your hearts today. I see the bulge of faith. I see the bulge of an answer. I see birth about ready to happen. I see it coming down the line. I see it ready to go. Because you've judged him faithful. You've conceived an answer. And because you've conceived the answer, you now have the ability and the strength of God to bear it. And all of a sudden it will come the day when you least expect it. Ladies, can I hear an amen? Your water will break. Whoops. It's time. And not every delivery is easy. Sometimes it takes strain. Some of you ladies can go in the hospital half an hour. There's the baby. How do you do that? And other ladies go in. It's five, six, seven, ten, twelve hours, whatever it may be. And you're laboring. And, and you, you can't just go to a lady like that and say, come on, honey. Get with the program. You have patience with that precious one. Because, friends, when your answer is born, you bear some pain. You'll bear some misunderstanding. I know my, my our, our daughter, we were in the room when our grandchild was born. And uh, our second grandchild. And uh, she said, okay, it's over. I'm done. 
she was on some drugs at that point because the doctor had helped her out. I, it's over. I'm done. I don't want to do this anymore. Well, hang on, honey. It's coming. <laughs> but when that baby is born, you have that sweet one in your arms. You can say to the world, this is what I worked so hard for. This is when I stood there and saw when I was most weak, God conceived something in my spirit. God gave me the strength to bear it. And now here is the proof. His answer has come. Friends, I'm telling you this morning. You are authorized. You are authorized to absolutely stand in his perfect faith. Those who do not lean to their own understanding, but acknowledge the Lord in all their ways, they're the ones who are going to see the grace of God come forth. I leave that with you this morning. How do you judge God? How do you judge God? My friend, I am persuaded of the reality of God's grace in our hearts and our lives. I am persuaded that whatever I have committed unto him, he will keep until that day. I am persuaded that God knows. And he's coming through. Look, I heard about a lady the other day. Um, and I've heard about this before. She delivered a baby, but there was a backup baby. How does that happen? And it was delivered three weeks later. Now, how'd you like to do that? Why are you back, Mrs. Jones? Well, I'm delivering another baby today. Woohoo! What a shock and surprise. How many pregnancies do we have lined up in our spirit? Some we know about and anticipate, some we don't. But I'm going to tell you right now, would you hear the word of the Lord? Listen carefully. There are answers lined up in, to, in you right now to problems that you don't even know. You have. I'm going to say it on this side. You have answers lined up within you. Already conceived with the Spirit. You're aware of some of them, but some of them you're not. Let me tell you what. The God of faithfulness has equipped you to bear and produce Every answer he has for you. My God. My God. My God. A young man asked his pastor one day. I don't, I don't know. There's too many questions. I can't go in the ministry because I, I can't answer these questions. And a pastor by the name of Brother Ham. Reverend Ham. H-A-M-M. Said to a very young Billy Graham, God knows what's going on. Just be faithful, be patient. Brother Ham never pastored more than about 50, 60, 70 people, something like that. And yet in his congregation was that young man, Billy Graham. And all this man did was plant in him the word, the word, the word, the word. And finally one day Billy Graham went out on some property out there and by an old stump. The story goes, knelt down and said, Lord, I can't answer all the questions, and I guess I'll never be that walking encyclopedia, but I'll tell you what, I surrender to you. Now, what do you want? And look what God did with Billy Graham, now in his 90s. The world has been changed because a pastor put a word in a young man's heart, and that young man outstripped anything that his pastor had ever done numeral wise, number wise. But I'm telling you what, Pastor Ham gets the same reward that Billy Graham gets because he was faithful to what he was called to. What are you called to? Are you judging God faithful? Would you stand your feet, please? You've given me extra time today and I appreciate that so very much. We love you. We serve you with great hope in our hearts that God will develop and perfect in you what needs to be developed. Mm. 
Would our altar workers come forward, please, at this time? Some of our altar workers. Go ahead on. I, I speak to your hearts this morning, and I just simply say, examine your heart. Don't grow weary in well-doing. For if you persist and are faithful, you'll reap the harvest. I speak to you this morning. As a pastor who loves his people he serves. Please never devaluate what God has done in your life. Never put yourself down. Don't do that. Always understand you're exactly what God wanted. Otherwise, you would never have been born. You are exactly filled with the gifts and the callings of God that he desired. And it's time for some of us to stand up and be counted and say, yes, Lord, I didn't think I could do anything, but I'll tell you what, I'll do what you want me to do. Start out small and watch God do the greater things through you. And maybe you need to seek the Lord this morning or just tell him, God, I surrender. I want to open the altars to you. Maybe you're here today and, and you have never made that commitment to Jesus Christ. And I'm just telling you right now, God loves you right where you are, wants to draw you close and strengthen you. And I just ask, today, if, you, if this is the day you surrender your heart to Jesus, you just give it all to him. Would you just raise your hand right where you are? No embarrassment in this. Just absolute truth. I'm whole hog into it all. I give it all, Lord. If that's you this morning, just raise your hand where you are. All right. How many of you can say this morning, look, I am challenged in my heart, and I'm going, I'm going forward. I'm going for it. Hello? All over the room. I'm going for it. to say for the blessing this morning I'm going to give you a pastoral blessing that Pastor Dean just has a couple of words to share with you oh God how we love you God how we love you merciful heavenly father how we love you how we adore you holy God holy God faithful are you we judge you faithful almighty God bless your name Church, may the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May he be gracious to you. His face shine upon you and give you peace. And may Holy Spirit powerfully move through all of our lives to accomplish his purpose, his dream, his vision. Through all of us, in Jesus' name. Amen. Hold steady.